and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We celebrate the eighth day of Easter, so the end of the Easter octave today, uh, so second Sunday of Easter, or also known as Divine Mercy Sunday. So we've got the image of our Lord's heart, um, his mercy, the blood and water pouring out from his heart. Uh, a revelation revealed to St. Faustina Kowalska, who lived from 1905 to 1938, a Polish nun, and then the devotion was extended to the whole church uh, through the ministry, <coughs> excuse me, and the uh, ministerium of St. John Paul II. The promise our Lord makes to those who celebrate this feast day today is, and those who receive communion and go to confession, is that they will not only receive the forgiveness of their sins, but also the grace of what's called the plenary indulgence, removal of punishment due to sin. So if we were to die in that state, we would go straight to heaven. We wouldn't need purgation. So it's a great grace that the Lord gives, and uh, that's the, hence the devotions this afternoon from 2 to 3, 3.15 p.m., finishing with benediction and having confession during that time. Let us once again then acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. <coughs> I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.
kindle the faith of the people you have made your own. Increase, we pray, the grace you have bestowed, that all may grasp and rightly understand in what font they have been washed, by whose spirit they have been reborn, by whose blood they have been redeemed. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever.
When I saw him, I fell in a dead faint at his feet. But he touched me with his right hand and said, Do not be afraid. It is I, the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now I am to live forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and of the underworld. Now, write down all that you see of present happenings and things that are still to come. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the sequence. Christians should have been actual victims of their sacrifice, sacrifice and praise. When the disciples said, 
we have seen the Lord. He answered, Unless I see the holes that the nails made in his hands, and can put my finger into the holes they made, and unless I can put my hand into his side, I refuse to believe. Eight days later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The doors were closed, but Jesus came in and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he spoke to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look, here are my hands. Give me your hand. Put it into my side. Doubt no longer, but believe. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You believe because you can see me. Happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. There were many other signs that Jesus worked and the disciples saw, but they are not recorded in this book. These are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing this you may have life through his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to read a fair bit about this feast, I recommend to you reading the diary of St. Faustina Kowalska. It's not a, a thin read, it's about this thick, but it's just her diary and all her interactions and conversations with our Lord, during which time not only he reveals his abundant mercy, his tremendous love for humanity, but he also tells her in great detail how he wanted to establish this feast. <coughs> and as I said at the beginning of Mass, she lived from 1905 to 1938. A quick calculation, her lifespan is 33 years old, the same as the life of Christ. But it took until 2000 and, I forget when now, 2001 maybe, uh, until it was established as a feast uh, in the Universal Church. Because things in the church obviously take time. And uh, 50 or 60 years seems a long time in our own lifetime, but in fact in the life of the church it isn't a long time at all. But what is this Feast of Divine Mercy really all about? It's essentially the same as the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, where so many in the world have forgotten the tender humanity and the compassion of our Lord. And the tenderness is not in the face of justice, but in the face of human vulnerability. Wherever God sees human weakness, wherever God sees suffering, wherever he sees hurt and pain, his heart is moved by this, and he wants to show people mercy. He wants to show them his tenderness, his compassion, that they are not alone. So our Lord revealed this devotion to St. Faustina, and he wanted a feast to be established in the church so that everybody could honour him. Now, this is the Sunday that he wanted this feast to be celebrated. And some might think, well, and I know have priests who I know and respect, say, you know, well, why would God want another feast established when you've got Easter for eight days and, uh, you know, it seems like a cluttering of things? Well, first of all, I don't question God, right? I think it's pretty silly of anyone to think, to tell God, you know, well, look, I think you should do it this way, really, or that way. Um, but anyway, the prophets from the Old Testament certainly did. They told God, I think you've got the wrong man for the job here. I think, you know, you should choose somebody else, and God ignores them, and, uh, and so forth. Ananias did it in the New Testament about St. Paul. He's saying, Lord, have you heard what this guy's been doing? He's been persecuting us Christians. He said, don't worry about that, mate. Uh, he's my chosen instrument, Saul. And anyway, and God turns St. Paul, or Saul, into St. Paul, and makes him a tremendous apostle to all the nations. 
So, God does what he wanted. Now, is there really such a conflict between having a feast of mercy that is tacked on to the eighth day of the feast of the resurrection of Jesus? Well, I don't think there's a conflict at all. Because, why did Jesus come to die and rise again for us in the first place, if not to show us the incredible mercy of God? God didn't come to show us his justice. That will be shown at the end of time in the universal judgment, where he will declare the verdict over how everybody has lived his or her life, the good and the bad. But God came to the human race to show us his mercy. And that's why it's actually most fitting that a feast focusing specifically on the mercy of God is part of the Easter feast. Jesus describes mercy, his mercy, as his greatest attribute. Now, pause there for a moment. Would anyone want to disagree with that? Just from what you know already? Because I remember talking about this when I was back in the seminary 30-something years ago. And someone said to me, well, I want to say that God's love is his greatest attribute. And certainly it is. But love has two sides. Justice and mercy. God cannot come to us in his justice. If he came to us in his justice, expecting justice, do we think we have much chance? None. None at all. Well, two chances, none or buckets, as we would say in Australia. We don't have any chance. In other words, we don't come to God as equals in a partnership. Oh God, you owe me this and I'll give you that, whatever. We always come appealing to his mercy. So yes, the love of God is his greatest attribute, but it is shown to us through mercy. And this is why St. Thomas Aquinas says that mercy is in fact the, the greatest attribute, because in showing mercy, what we are doing is responding to a perceived need, to someone that we do not owe anything to, but we reach out to them. In fact, in, in showing us mercy, God is going beneath himself to raise up his creature, us, and to restore us back to his friendship and his compassion, his, his life of grace. So, mercy, from God's point of view, is in fact his greatest attribute, because we have no chance to come to him in his justice. In fact... When throughout the novena of the Divine Mercy, which I know some of us have been praying throughout these last nine days, I know some of you have as well, his number eight each day, our Lord asks Saint Faustina to bring to him a particular portion of the human race. So day one, bring to me all sinners, hardened sinners, you know, and then priests and religious and the souls of little children and those who venerate my mercy. Well, on number eight, at day eight, so that was Friday, he says, bring to me the souls detained in purgatory. And he says, these are very much loved by me, but they are doing justice, they're glorifying my justice, because they need to be purified in my love. They're not yet ready to enter into heaven. But... I am showing them my mercy because I have given them really another chance to be purified completely for the lack of purification that hasn't taken place during their lifetime. So the mercy of God is indeed the greatest attribute, which is that side of his love to us. We see that this is actually what Jesus shows towards his disciples today as he appears to them. He goes in and the first greeting he says, peace be with you. So he wouldn't have said it in Greek, he would have said it in Hebrew. Shalom, shalom. And shalom doesn't just mean peace in Hebrew, it means good health, 
well-being. It's wishing somebody blessings upon their life. It does mean peace as well, right? But it also means a whole lot of other things as well. So it's one of the nicest, kindest things that you could say to somebody. If Jesus were responding to them in justice, these are the men who had abandoned him as he was dying. Do you think he would have come back and said, Oh, shalom, guys? He would have come and started knocking heads together, you know? And uh, telling them, this one, why did you run away? Why did you deny me? And whatever. <coughs> Christ doesn't come in justice. He comes in mercy. And then, as if that were not enough, he, he tells them, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And talks about the forgiveness of sins. It's interesting why he focuses on sin. Because sin is the greatest area where we have need of mercy. It isn't just, our greatest needs are not just in human pain, failed relationships, a business deal that's gone, uh, whatever, pear shaped, someone who's rejected us. These things are painful, but the area where we need greatest mercy is the area of our relationship with God. So, the gift of the Holy Spirit to forgive us our sins. And then, we told the story of Thomas. Again, with Thomas, he could have had some harsh words to Thomas, but he didn't. He comes in again, peace be with you. And by the way, you remember when Jesus sends out the 72 in pairs to all the towns in Galilee where he himself was to go? Remember he instructed them, let your first words be, what were they? Peace, shalom. Peace to this house. Peace. In other words, you are going to be ambassadors of my mercy. My mercy. You see how profound the theme of mercy is. And then to Thomas, again he doesn't speak harshly, he says, Thomas, come here, mate. Thomas had a wound. His wound was a spiritual wound. It was the wound of unbelief. Unbelief. He, he could not believe. You might say in today's terms, agnosticism. How many people we've come across and heard, you know, I'm an atheist. But then when you scratch beneath the surface a little bit, it's actually, it's not an atheist. They're an agnostic. That I find it hard to believe, coming from a Greek word, without knowledge. I don't feel I have enough knowledge to believe that they believe that there's a superior being out there because they realize it's madness to think all this world just came out of nothing and there's no cause. That, because that's where atheism is so nutty, because it actually makes no sense to think that I have evidence to suggest there is no God. All the evidence suggests there is a supernatural being. But to go from that knowledge, our natural world, knowledge of the natural world, to believe that this God has a personal interest in me, that the being that has created all of this has a personal interest in me and my salvation, that is a statement of faith. I don't come to that knowledge unless it is given to me. So these people who say there are atheists, they're really agnostic. Agnostic. And Thomas was agnostic. He couldn't believe that Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead. He had to see him. So Jesus then goes further. Put your finger. And you can just imagine, I mean I imagine, put his finger into the holes that the Lord, that the nails made. And as his finger went into the hole of Jesus' hand, I imagine Thomas's finger was becoming invisible, was being hidden. And as he put his hand into the side of Thomas, oh, you know, Thomas put his hand into the side of Jesus, his hand would have vanished in there. And Thomas couldn't believe what is going on. And at that moment, Christ showed him mercy and healed the wound of his unbelief. And then he makes that great statement. Now, that statement isn't just simply what it seems in the beginning. My Lord and my God, Jesus says, you believe because you can see me. Happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. 
at a surface reading or surface level, it seems as though Jesus is saying that he believes in him being risen from the dead, that Jesus had come back to life. Who thinks that that's what Jesus is getting at? A couple of hands. Who thinks it's something else? Yeah, put your hands up. <laughs> Everyone should put your hands up. There's more. You see, when someone you didn't believe was risen from the dead is now living in front of you, is that faith anymore? Do I need faith to know that you're all sitting here listening to me? No, that is not faith. That is obvious. That's, that's straight my senses. I trust that what my eyes are telling me are, are real and, and it's, uh, it connects with reality. And so there's no need for belief. It is immediate. I hear a sound from this direction. I turn to my right because that's where the sound is coming from. And generally, I'm right. There is a sound. I may be mistaken about the sound, or whatever it's coming, or, you know, what, what it's, how loud or what it's coming from, but generally my senses are right. So, Thomas seeing Jesus in front of him, talking to him, is not a statement of faith. But there is a statement of faith. You believe because you can see me. Happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's us, by the way, unless anyone's had a vision of Jesus. Okay, no one, right. So we're all there. We believe. But what is it that we believe? Do we just believe that Jesus is risen from the dead? No, we do believe that. That's not all. We believe that he is God. This is Thomas's statement of faith. Because he could see Jesus risen from the dead, but he couldn't see the divinity inside him that has brought him back to the dead. And, but he believed it to be there because he knew that Jesus could not have come back to life again unless he was who he said he was, namely God. So that is the statement of faith, my Lord and my God. It's not just what he saw with his eyes, but rather what he didn't see. That's what required a belief in something not seen. After all, that's the definition of faith, to believe in things that we haven't seen because of the one who has revealed them to us, namely God. That's why we believe in our Catholic faith, because we know God knows all things, God only speaks the truth, God never deceives, and so we trust Him. We trust Him. So, there's a lot of aspects there of the mercy of Jesus shown in the Gospel today. We see the theme in the opening reading. We see the theme also in the second reading from the book of the Apocalypse. Jesus, John had not seen Jesus for however many decades since he descended into heaven. John wrote when he was about 90. He was very old when he wrote. And it's clear that he saw Jesus. But he, he falls into a dead faint. He doesn't cry out and says, Hey, Jesus, it's been a long time since we've seen you. Hey, you Dominic, you look very different to how we saw you when you left the earth. No, Jesus overwhelms him with his presence, but then he reaches out and lifts him up. Mercy, mercy, mercy. So today I invite you to take full advantage of the gift that Christ is giving to us and to seek to drink of his mercy on a daily basis. Because it's only when we know how good the mercy of God is for us that we will want to invite others, particularly those who are living very far from God, to want to receive his mercy as well. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to touch the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Sisters and brothers, as we profess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we confidently raise up our prayers to our Heavenly Father. That with faith in Christ, the Holy Church will always bear witness to the spread of the Gospel. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Pope and all bishops and priests may continue to proclaim the new life that Jesus Christ offers to all people. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That local and world leaders may work for lasting peace, grounded in humility and justice. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That nations will put aside division and hate and seek peace. We pray that armed conflicts will cease immediately particularly where the homes and lives of civilians are being destroyed. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who doubt their faith may find belief in Christ, who was once dead, but now lives forever. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our diocese will be blessed with selfless hearts that are willing to serve the Lord in priestly or religious life. Pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That in this community we will always place our trust in the risen Lord and bear witness to our faith. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all men and women serving in the armed forces will be kept safe while serving their country and be supported after their service is finished. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who have died in war will be honoured by their nations and be received into God's eternal kingdom. We also pray for recently deceased Sister Petulia Mitzi, Frank Lintot, Sam Hilly, Yolanda Renda, and Isabella Basso, and all those mentioned in our parish bulletin. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our loving Father, having not seen, we believe in Jesus Christ as true God and true man. Hear our prayers and help us to sustain our faith in the same Jesus, who rose to glory with you. We ask this through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
and on the Catholic and Apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you, for them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. Celebrating the most sacred day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, and in communion <coughs> with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you also for those to whom you have been pleased to give the new birth of water and the Holy Spirit, granting them forgiveness of all their sins. Order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation, and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the bread and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who, through this participation at the altar, receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to finish the end of my life, but I will say the word, and my soul shall be. Oh. 
that our reception of this Paschal Sacrament may have a continuing effect in our minds and hearts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please take a copy of the bulletin home with you and read it. There's a few updates there about various things happening in our parish. Um, but the most important things I draw your attention to are the Divine Mercy devotions this afternoon from 2 till 3. There will be confessions available. And then finishing with 3 o'clock, the chaplet. And then the prayers for benediction with the Blessed Sacrament. And uh, secondly, tomorrow being Anzac Day, I'm a real pause and commemoration in our country for all those who have sacrificed their lives for the, the, the highest goods, really, our freedom, our ability to believe in the God and practice our religion and so forth. And uh, so there'll be a Mass at 10 a.m. here uh, to remember that commemoration and pray for the souls of those who have fallen um, in their giving their life for the greatest sacrifice that they could make. The Lord be with you. Bow your heads for the blessing. May Almighty God bless you through today's Easter solemnity and in his compassion defend you from every assault of sin. Amen. Amen. And may he who restores you to eternal life in the resurrection of his only begotten Son endow you with the prize of immortality. Amen. Now that the days of the Lord's passion have drawn to a close, may you who celebrate the gladness of the Paschal Feast Come with Christ's help and exulting in spirit to those feasts that are celebrated in eternal joy. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thank you.